Namaste. Welcome to satsang today. <clears throat> and I just wanted to take a moment before we get into it, just to uh, take a, a minute, uh, just to silently, each one of us, if you want to with me, just offer some prayers and love to those parts of the world that really need it right now. And it's not just um, places that have been um, battered by uh, weather, severe weather and things like that. For those that, wherever they may be, that are suffering, that need some love and some help. Thank you. I hope they find uh, peace. So um, today uh, we have a lot of questions to get through so uh, that have been sent in. Some of them, uh, quite a lot of them, are on the same lines. Um, there seems to be a theme this uh <clears throat> this last week or so coming up about self-love and uh, compassion. So I'll dive into these and then we'll, uh, I'll open up in a little while for questions here. So this uh, first one says, um, I still think I am a separate person. I keep remembering my past hurts as I am completely alone and have no friends or family. I can't leave my apartment or building as my building elevator is out of service from the 28th of December till sometime in April. I live on the fifth floor and I have arthritis in my hips. It's very painful to live. So um, you're obviously right in the middle of that period where the, the elevator is uh, not working. So, so Spiritually speaking, I don't want to, to go into uh, any other kind of uh, advice here because there's, there's other agencies, other people that can help if you can reach out. Uh, spiritually speaking, whatever situation you are finding yourself in, uh, obviously there's, uh, you've mentioned here, feeling alone and um, remembering your past hurts and still thinking that you're a separate person. So those things are going to cause more suffering than the actual physical circumstances, believe it or not. It is obviously very challenging to be in physical pain. And I've had a reminder of this the last couple of weeks or months myself, but suffering is not the same as being in physical pain. Suffering often with a human being comes along with physical pain, but the two things are not exactly the same. Suffering comes from resistance to our circumstances. So an acceptance of how things are for you right now, as much as you can, is going to help with everything. So acceptance does not mean liking your circumstances. Uh, you would not choose this, you would never enjoy this, you wouldn't like it, but there can be a deeper acceptance of uh, how things are in this moment for each and each one of us. And for my own self, in my journey, several times, um, at least three or four times, whether it be something with my body or something with my outer circumstances, uh, there was this period where um, I was forced to stop literally. So my car would break down, uh, flat tires. I had to stop work uh, when my shoulder got really bad. I was cleaning houses for a living. 
Uh, and literally three or four times at least, maybe more, I was actually just forced to a stop. And that was um, the last thing my mind wanted. Of course, there were financial worries and all sorts, but it forced me to have this period of kind of isolation from my normal life. And it forced me to look at things where, where I thought I was going, what I thought I wanted, and to really reassess where things were, which way I was heading, and even assessing, reassessing, is what I'm doing spiritually even working? If I'm not making any progress, if I still think I'm a separate being, which I did at the time every time, where am I sustaining that now? And each time one of these moments happened, I was talking about it with someone the other day, there was this great humbling that happened. And I don't mean humbling in the normal sort of worldly way. I meant humbling as in spiritually. Um, and uh, a real noticing of my awakening not progressing the way that I wanted it to go. Or my awakening going backwards and seemingly and uh, not getting any closer to the goal so there was this fiercely independent thing that I had going on I'm going to make it myself to awakening and I'm going to do it all by myself because at that time I was very much alone too and uh, terrified of everyone and everything pretty much so um, the reason I'm saying all this is maybe you can look again at why this is happening I mean, there's this whole set of circumstances have come together to be in this situation you're in right now. And <clears throat> of course, getting any physical, social, financial help that you can for this situation that you find yourself in. But spiritually speaking, what is this here to show you? Is this here? And sometimes this is the only way we let go. It certainly was for me. So we've been forced to actually when I couldn't actually get myself dressed or even make myself a cup of tea when I was in that much pain with my shoulder, uh, I couldn't hold a pen, I couldn't write, I couldn't uh, even lift my arm up this far to type on a keyboard, I couldn't drive, <clears throat> couldn't work, couldn't do anything that I used to do. It was um, a big uh, clearing away of a lot of stuff uninvited, unwanted, unwelcomed until I really sort of embrace that. Okay, if this is happening, let me see what this is about. And uh, it's come back a few times really for this extra um, sweeping away of what we might need to let go of. Sometimes as human beings, that's the only way we do. So Things like this, they're usually very unpleasant, but they force us to let go deeper. There's a deeper surrender. And uh, can you find that willingly inside? Why is there such strong allegiance for all of us to these thoughts about being a separate being? Why is there such strong allegiance to your remembering your past hurts rather than this present moment, what's going on in this present moment for you? Can you see that this might be forcing you to really look at those again? <clears throat> because if we keep putting our attention on the same old things, we're going to keep getting the same old results. And each one of us is holding on to our sense of being a separate being in different and unique ways to everyone else. But it's the same thing that's going on universally, isn't it? I will not let go of these particular thoughts. And of course, we're not thinking that consciously. We just really value certain thoughts of others. Some we let go of easily, some we hold on to for quite some time, lifetimes even. And do you want these to be the last thoughts that pass through your brain before you leave this body? Let's get it really real here. Because, you know, there's a strong chance then that you'll be in a different body in a few earthly years, going through the exact same process as you're going through right now so digging deep inside and asking invoking inviting that place inside us that has the strength to let go of these things we can't directly change our outer circumstances but we can live the best um, manifestation possible 
in this moment where help will come from all kinds of unknown places, visible and invisible, if we are open to um, driving a wedge between ourselves and the separate self. So my thoughts, my hurts, my situation, my awakening. Can you hear the separateness in that? And I'm not judging at all. I've been right there, and that's why I'm really talking about this. It was my karmic patterns that I couldn't overcome that were reflecting as this shoulder pain, actually. I was giving myself a great burden, carrying it right here, to have to be the one to overcome my karmic patterns, which, of course, just reinforced my separate sense of self. And it went on for 20, 30 years at least. It was not fun. Next one. Dear Helen, thank you so much for your wonderful teaching. Everything I hear from you finds a response in my heart. I've been working on my judgment for quite a while already, and I've come to realize that I am a very critical, I'm very, very critical and strict with myself, and there is little or no love for myself as well. This is exactly what I'm projecting onto other people. However, I am projecting myself on, onto them. I couldn't find a meditation for self-compassion. I'd really want to have it from you if possible, if it's possible. Uh, there's a beautiful meditation called Loving Acceptance of What Is. Yep. So if anyone wants that, it is in the list of uh, on YouTube. So that's I'm with Helen Hamilton YouTube on the guided meditations playlist. It's on there. Um, and it's very close to what I think I need. However, I feel that acceptance or love is going from outside to inside, and my inside is empty. Also, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you so much. Much love. P.S. I would love to hear everything about self-compassion. Can this topic be for our extra class? I've read some gurus were assigning to their pupils a year of self-compassion meditation. I can be one of them. So bad is that. So there's a couple of things in what you've written here that really struck uh, struck me as deeply important here. Um, firstly, the fact that you're seeing just how critical you are of yourself, how judgmental you are of yourself, um, and even the fact that you're judging other people, you're judging yourself for that. The fact that you can see it means you're coming out of it already. It may not feel like that, but the first way we come out of it is to begin to actually look at our thought process in a more, uh, with a little distance. Um, when I when I began to recognize this in myself, pretty much 99.99% of all of my thoughts about myself were either at very least uh, disdain, dislike, uh, angry at myself, some of them outright um, uh, ways I would never speak to anyone else, hatred, self-hatred, things like that. And it was shocking. It was really shocking really shocking i actually could not uh get over it for quite some time it took me a good month or so to really accept because i was meditating a lot i was feeling a lot of peace and silence and um most of what was going on in thought process was going on under the under the surface and when i actually began to become aware of it because I was that love more and more, I was being that love, that this stuff, this critical judgmental stuff could come up in front of me to see. <clears throat> this is where you need to allow this love to flow. This is what you think about yourself on the egoic level. This is what your ego thinks about you because it thinks it knows you. So that's the first thing. How do we go about self-compassion? You know, I was listening to um, Ram Das podcast uh, the other day and he was talking about, it was an old one, uh, talking about um, the Dalai Lama and uh, his views on uh, the word compassion. And I was astonished because uh, he said that um, 
in the English language, according, and I'm paraphrasing the Dalai Lama, uh, according to in English language, there is no word for self-compassion. If you look, and I looked this morning, etymology of compassion, it means suffering with others or feeling sorrow or pity for someone who's suffering. So, but not for our own self. The very essence of the word compassion it excludes ourself here, this body mind. So I love what you've put here, self-compassion. I like that. <clears throat> so um noticing first that you're noticing this. That's the most important thing you could do right now. And there is a certain song I did years ago now called From Self-Hate to Self-Love. I would, uh, I'll try and see if you can link it in the description when this goes up on YouTube. Uh, I'd suggest watching that. Not judging. The best that you can to not judge the thoughts that come up. Your mind is talking, your ego is talking about you because it thinks it knows you. So if somebody called you now on the phone from a different country and said, I really don't like you. You're really not the person that you should be. And uh, you judge people too much. And, you know, it, this conversation, this person you'd never met, and who had never met you from across the other side of the world, called you and told you, started telling you all kinds of horrible things. You wouldn't take too much uh, weight or put too much stock in what they were saying because they've never met you. Yet we listen to our mind as if it has met us. For all your mind can do is think about you. It's never met you. It's never met you, your mind. It's talking about who it thinks you are. And that could, be not, could not be more opposite than who you really are. So I'd like you to listen, and we will do a self-compassion uh, thing. Uh, I'd like you to uh, listen to what you've said here. It's very close to what I think I need, the loving acceptance of what is meditation. However, I feel that acceptance or love is going from outside to inside, and my inside is empty. So either two things you can do with this. This is the whole crux of it right here. First of all, find out if it really is going from outside to inside. What if that idea is not true? What if that meditation is evoking, invoking, evoking, inviting, allowing this love that's already here to come from the inside out? What if you flip that over? Can you even ever begin to love yourself if, if that bit's flipped over? You love yourself anyway, but on the mind and body level I'm talking about here. And find out, you know, if your inside is empty, find out what emptiness is. It's not empty at all. It is so full. I mean, it is full of the universe. The whole cosmos is inside you. Everything that ever was, is, and will be, could be. And that's full. So either flip that one over and see that it's coming from the inside out. Even if I say some loving words to you now, that's still not from the outside in. I am inside you. I am you. I am you showing up to remind you of what you've currently forgotten, in the mind at least. Find out what is inside. Like your life depends on it. Find out what this empty inside is. It's empty of substance. It's empty of a someone. It's empty of criticism. It's empty of judgment. It's empty of everything except love. Pure, non-dual uh, love. Just love. Loving your mind and body exactly as they are right now, with no conditions at all possible even. Not even seeing them as a mind and body. So whichever one of those feels, and I would suggest doing both if it's a spiritual emergency like this, find out what inside really is. And then you won't need anything from anyone else ever. You'll have so much of it that it'll be spilling out of you constantly faster than you could ever um, manage. It'll just be this infinite supply. 
just oozing out of you without you even doing anything and just making everyone around you feel slightly better about themselves. We can talk about this more. I mean, uh, some gurus are signing their pupils to a year of self-compassion meditation. That's okay. I have nothing against that kind of thing. And, you know, horses for courses, if it suits some people. But what I did when I first started to hear about self-love was to set out to love myself unconditionally. And because I was feeling unworthy of this love that I was trying to give myself, I realized it must be able to come. I used this practice, this focus, this commitment to self-love as a way to fail and prove my own unworthiness. So, you know, if I gave you a year of, okay, for, for, from this point forward for a year, I'd like you to focus on loving yourself. That's only useful if it comes from you wanting to do it, feeling it's time, feeling it's the right thing. Not from, oh my God, I'm so bad. I need to do something about this. I should love myself, but I don't. Can you feel the difference? The first motivation, love is emerging here and I want to help it. That's going to be successful. The second one, you're going to use any practice that's given. You're going to sabotage it unknowingly, as we all do, and improve your own, in your mind at least, prove your own unworthiness. See, I can't even do this loving compassion meditation thing. Been there, done that. Got 10,000 t-shirts, you know, so. I'm just saying. More important than any meditation or anything you do is your reason for doing it. The reason for doing any spiritual practice is always the most important thing. Self-love is already beginning to emerge for you, otherwise you wouldn't write something like this. Find out if your mind really knows who you are. And then let me know. Okay. Helen, I want to thank you for your very direct and practical teachings, uh, which you so lovingly give us in every satsang. I have been following your pointings and have reached a state of complete peace, joy, and contentment. I had an experience that I consider an epiphany. I don't know how precise, I don't know precisely how long it lasted. In fact, there was no time. It was just peace, love, silence, and the absence of any fear. Words do not grasp the reality of this experience. But I would like your help. Right now, I'm going through a depressive state, which has been causing me pain. There are unpleasant sensations in the body and soul. I have had a lot of depression in the past, but since uh, 2018, I've never taken any medication. My work and my finances are also being impacted. I believe it is the result of a deepening in satsang, how to deal with it, much love and gratitude. So it's very common that after a deepening and opening, uh, an epiphany, a realization of who you actually are, that the mind expects that that will just continue effortlessly minded. And I was very shocked afterwards to find this middle phase, I'm going to call it, I don't really like that, but um, where in order to live this um, awakening, this unitive peace, whatever I'm going to call it, complete peace, joy and contentment, absence of fear, inability to suffer, what we must do then is examine the thoughts that come up that we still believe. So our body and mind get this boost and they're living on a higher level. But the beliefs that we're holding on to unknowingly are then very much more out of alignment start to show up in our life as our experience. So for me, it was fear. Uh, I had to really look at fear. This idea behind fear that I'm not safe. Anger. Um, I can't get what I want, I'm out of control, you know, those kind of ideas. And shame, uh, guilt, unworthiness, very similar vibrations. There's something fundamentally flawed about me. I could only really examine these after having seen clearly what I actually am. This is happening to you now. So as the self, as the infinite um, silence, only then can you look at these ideas that we held on to as a separate being. 
And if they're coming up for you, it's because you can transcend them now. So what does depression say to you? What does it want to say? Uh, I went through very difficult depression in my life. Um, and uh, there was some apathy. Uh, it wasn't a depression like I'd been through before, but it definitely came back up in some way after awakening. Some kind of deep grief an apathetic state to life, an apathetic way of there's just no point. It was quite a shock, really, because of, of having this uh, breakthrough <clears throat> and generally feeling a lot of peace, bliss, even love. So in order to live like this, to allow it to flow through your mind and body, to be, live this 24-7 effortlessly, we have to look at these stories that we're still holding. What does this feeling say to you? What does it say? If it could tell you something, what would it say to you? What's its major motivation, depression? And I mentioned a few, and um, just get sitting with it and seeing what it says to you. And then questioning if that's true. It's true as a separate being. There's no point in trying to be happy. There's no way to be happy as a separate being, permanently at least. And as uh, the self, then we are the source of happiness, you see. Then we can uh, begin to really um, question these beliefs from a different place of understanding. Can't question them really effectively, permanently, release them as a separate being because they feel so very true. But now you can see this rising in front of you because of your awakening succeeding. So find out what the story wants to tell you. Nobody wants to look at this kind of feeling, but it's not going to go away completely until you do. And see, this is a perspective of the separate self, the someone I used to take myself to be, and that it's not coming up now because I'm failing, because I've lost that beautiful peace, joy. It may seem like you've lost it. It's just temporarily eclipsed by this belief that needs to be looked at. Mine saying here... Look at this for me, please, because I can't resolve this. And I want effortless peace as much as you do. So here, I'm giving you this emotion, this story that's wrapped up in this real deep, low frequency emotion. And can you help me with it? So have a look and see where that comes, uh, what comes out of that. And then you can use the contemplative technique. Is this actually true now? Sitting with a question. And again, if you're not familiar with contemplation the way I'm describing it, there's um, core teachings playlists on the YouTube channel. Um, and it's contemplation, the antidote to believing. So hope that uh, helps. It will help you to sit with a question. Okay. I'll read this one and then we'll open it up. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question here live, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, We'll take two or three at least, uh, at most probably. Um, hello, Helen. Tension is my second name. Hello, Tension. Nice to meet you. I was angry from Batley, West Yorkshire, scared, uh, ashamed, uh, terrified. <laughs> yeah, I was in a tangled mess. Tension is my second name. This, this is why I'm looking for awakening. I want to be free from myself. Feeling super emotional and inadequate is holding me back from feeling safe in my life. I isolate myself to not feel emotions. Doesn't work that though, does it? From theory, I know that these thoughts are only thoughts. I should allow everything to be as it is. Also feel my emotions and not avoid them. And I'm already present which I am looking for, but it's still only theory for me. And it seems like fear and unworthiness will never leave me. I know it's illusion, but really persistent illusion. And I totally understand that. <clears throat> How to stop feeling overwhelmed and running away from everything in life. When I'm doing self-inquiry during meditation, I feel that I am before even thoughts. I am not separated from everything, from anything. But during interaction with people, I feel very, I, excuse me, during interaction with people, 
I very quickly turn on panic mode, how to feel safe. Much love from Poland. So this second sentence, I want, this is the way I'm looking. This is why I'm looking for awakening. I want to be free from myself. What do you want to be free from? That which is suffering, right? This um, tangled, neurotic, chaotic, emotional mess of a separate being. And I'm describing in general. I mean, that might be your situation, but from my own experience as well. <clears throat> Never more so do we want to get away from that after we have tasted the presence. So you've said here, when I'm doing self-inquiry during meditation, I feel that I am before even thoughts. That's profound, isn't it? There's something about me that is before the mind, before the body, before emotions, before even the separate sense of a someone I am. And when you taste that, even for a fraction of a second, of course, of course, the thing that's going to happen then is this intense desire to live as that. Not only to live as that, but to live as that 24-7 and then to live as that 24-7 effortlessly where it doesn't matter where my body and mind is, who they're with, what they're doing, how they're feeling. This presence that I am is evident and it's everywhere and it's everyone and everything. So first of all, the first thing that most of us do, as I did, is to uh, draw the conclusion, come to the conclusion that the way to find this presence and live as it is to push away the old sense of self. That is not me and it should go away. I'm not my mind. I'm not my body. I'm not my senses. I'm not my relationships. I'm not my finances. I'm not my spiritual journey even and I get that right that's a nice place to hang out and of course you want the presence but if you want to be and live as that presence and you can use the word silence or god or self capital s or stillness or whatever you want to call that I'm going to call it presence here just for this we have to be the presence with our mind and our body. How would the presence be with our mind and our body and our tangled neurotic mess of self, separate self? Is it pushing it away? And this was the hardest thing for me to get, really. It took me a long time. But never by pushing against something is it going to go away. In fact, I feel more separate than ever when I push against my egoic sense of self because it seems like there's a me and it. There's two things and I'm suffering again. My peace disappears, seemingly. So can you do me the biggest favor of all and stop pushing against this sense of someone? I want to be free from myself. I'd like you to change that to, I want to be free from what I think about myself, or I want to be free from my thoughts about myself. And then from there, it's just one tiny nudge to, I'm already free. You've seen that already. I'm already free from my thoughts about myself. You've seen that you before thoughts. The only thing that sustains the egoic sense of self, the separate sense of self in us, is pushing it away. The only thing. And we do what everyone does. We go, I've seen that that's not who I am. It should just disappear now. But in doing that, we're making two things, me and it. This is core division that really is what hurts us spiritually. The idea that there's two things when there really is only one. This egoic sense of self is a way that I'm showing up I created it. It's my baby. I gave birth to it. I've been cultivating it for a very long time. Is it really going to work to feel peace, to push away something that is a part of me? Is that really going to work? Here is the greatest self-compassion of all then. I can lovingly understand that that's not me and also just leave it be. I don't need to push against it. 
I want to be free from the thoughts about myself. Well, to do that, you must stop pushing against them. Understanding why your mind thinks it knows you, or ego, and understanding why those aren't true, it's never met you. You could think about a country far away from where your body is right now. You could read books about it, you could watch YouTube videos about it, you could talk to someone who grew up there, you could be best friends with that person. You could even go and visit that country and come home again, and you still wouldn't know what it's like to live there, would you? A mind is like that. It thinks it knows us. It takes snapshot photographs. It's got a whole uh, library of snapshot photographs, and it draws a conclusion from these, from an arbitrary moment in time and space, a collection of those, and it can never really see the essence of you. So really understanding this is where compassion comes from self-love so if you want to be free be free from the pushing against it first make friends with it the best that you can whatever that means to you in this moment for me that was can I understand why mind is this way can I understand why my ego hates me first of all because if I come to understand that is love in action it's wisdom in action I'm not going to push it away because I'll see it's not who I am and it's not even affecting me so I don't need to do anything with it first thing we do when we stop identifying as that is we start to identify with it again by saying it has to disappear it's affecting me I'm affected by this it should go away what if it's just there this tangled ball of stuff inside the greater self that you are the presence can the presence push it away? That which you saw about yourself that exists before thoughts and during and after, can it push against anything? Does it have that capacity? Or is this push-pull thing also a part of this tangled ball of stuff that we call our sense of who we are? So hope that helps. When you start to accept yourself that way, you'll start to accept others that way. And you won't feel this panic then. As your own sense of separateness dissolves, you won't feel, whether your body's in a room with a thousand other bodies or totally the only body in the room, you'll feel the same. Because you won't be believing in other beings. So, okay, uh, we'll go to Robin when you're ready. Hi, Helen. Hi. Um, I had a, a conversation with one of my Sangha buddies earlier today. He, um, we decided to chat. I wanted to support him. He's um, taking care of his mother who has terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> my wife died 10 years ago of terminal cancer. And I looked after her for five years um, during that process. And um, my wife died, died at home. She didn't want to die in the hospital. And uh, her family came to see her. And, but then they left and I was with her until the, until the end. But she died late. She passed away very late at night. And um, when she passed away, I had dozed off. And I've always regretted that I was not awake I was physically there but I was not awake when she passed because for me the point when you leave your body is a very important time or that was my belief system at the time basically yeah. so um you know I felt that I'd come to terms with this and whatever but when I talked to my buddy about this today uh I don't know why but I afterwards I felt quite upset and it's actually got worse and then um as you know i held uh i was hosting a sangha for the new zealand people but i didn't talk about it and we did the statement process there not on this but on what was happening in new zealand and i felt better but um that feeling is continuing so this is why i'm i'm bringing this up i don't know why you know 
I can understand there's some regret, but you know, this is something that happened 10 years ago. I thought I'd come to terms with it, but it's coming up quite strongly now. Anyhow, so that's why I'm asking you how to yeah. deal with it, really. <clears throat> um, so if it's coming up again now, it must be relevant now to your deepening. Um, and maybe you've looked at this, resolved it on some some level, of course, come to peace around it. And maybe there's just a deeper way now that this can release inside you, you know, something around that. And <clears throat> so there's this sense of um, regret, you said, uh, that was the word, I think, wasn't it, that, that you fell asleep at that last moment. Um, and that is... Uh, of course, understandable, uh, you know, you were probably exhausted five years taking care of someone. Um, I can only imagine what that was like, uh, you know, so even phys just the physical aspect of that is very difficult, um, even without looking at the emotional impact of that. But there is this idea in there, isn't there, that you uh made a decision or you could have done something about it that you shouldn't have fallen asleep can you see that idea in there yeah well there's also you know i think i guess all family members or people you love you have this thing like i'm going to try and save my partner i'm going to try and save the yeah. person that i love yeah and then life doesn't quite work out that way you know yeah and um, you know without this idea uh maybe now you can look at this idea in a different light that you you could have should have would have done something different mm -hmm. um and yes you might have liked it a different way but not from the regret and guilt of i should have been able to stay awake in that moment because how it was was how it was, and it could not have been any other than it was in that moment. And, you know, just offering a different perspective maybe that might help. Um, maybe in your sleep you are in a different place energetically where you could help her in a different way, literally making that transition. You know, without the waking state there for you, there's more resources there. Um, there are beings that help uh, help us make that transition out of the body especially if we feel we're a separate being when we do that it's quite a shocking experience to suddenly look at my body and go wow that's that's not me if i was sure it was uh, so maybe there's that i don't know you know i'm just throwing out a different perspective maybe it was some choice on some level to not be awake in the in the classic waking state way uh, when she actually left her body so that you could be there with her on a, on a different uh, level dimension plane whatever you want to call it um, and ease her through that process you know, I have heard stories of that you know uh, even uh, people going into deep meditation on purpose uh, right before someone makes their, tra their transition to to be there on the on the I'm going to say the word other side, but I really don't like that on the invisible realms, let's say. So I don't know if that gives you some some that the main thing here that's causing the regret is the idea that you made a choice on mm -hmm. some level that you could have done something different. Can you see that? Yeah, so you're saying I didn't have a choice or I did choose or well, there is no a, choice. You didn't have Life a choice on the level of the separate sense of someone. Uh -huh. No free will in that way, right? Because the mind says, I'm going to stay awake. As long as this takes, I'm going to be there. Hmm. And the imaginary separate self says that. No free will on that level. But on a, on a higher level, there really is an energe energetic. Um, there might have been a higher choice to say, well, actually, she might be more confused after than before she leaves her body, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, 
there are certain beings who who never physically incarnate but that is their role to guide that process for beings who are very confused mm -hmm. coming out of the amnesia of i am this body and I don't know if that's the choice you made. I'm just sort of throwing a different perspective into it. So um, you are, and she is so much more than just this body. You know, who knows uh, what that decision was. But just to recognize that um, the free will that we have is not on the level that we think it is. Mm -hmm. A separate someone. And at the end of the day, if you were supposed to be asleep, you were asleep. Cannot change that now. There must be another reason for that. But we don't really have access to that kind of understanding if we're blaming ourselves for our regret, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Hope that helps bring some peace. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine? Um, I always have something prepared and then uh, when it comes to saying anything, I'm not quite sure why I'm, uh, what it is that I'm trying to say, which actually, um, I just thought that we, um, <clears throat> in sanghas and satsangs and on Zoom, we're, we're here from this way up kind of thing. That's, that's, that's what we are. And we have these intellectual sort of discourse and there's a lot about words and um, a lot of talk about mind and thoughts and feelings and all that go with that. But I just have a question, what of the body's intelligence and the kind of sensate experience that um, has a place, well, in my experience, it has a place, but um, I just wonder how that fits in because uh, it's not often to do with words and intellectual concepts and, and so forth. It's, it's, I was going to say an experience, but it can be more than mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, so, and, and it's just something, well, I've just said, you can't talk about it. <laughs> I just wonder, <laughs> you know, I never hear it talked about you know that the body has an intelligence that the body can show us as much as a story that the mind is going through and that we have mm -hmm. to deal with in contemplation or something um so yeah i don't know what my question was is <laughs> but i'm just putting it out there because somewhere it's it's going round in me and agitating so yeah <laughs> From from um, from my own experience, that the body is um, it is the self, and therefore it is sentience itself. And um, for me, there was a stage where only getting in touch with the deep wisdom of the body was. Um, first of all encountering that my my body my cells my the deepest essence of myself physically was uh afraid uh that there, there was this this knowness this i don't like life there was this fight or flight mechanism literally inside each each and every cell and then even when i encountered this soft peace there was this gentle peace and bliss even there's something in my body my cells it's just I, i'm not sure about that I don't want to be forced into anything I don't want to feel like there's some fear of God or something it, some and I try my best to put words to it but hopefully you get a sense of it that somewhere in my DNA written into into my DNA was this fear of the divine and for, so uh from from eons of uh 
scriptures uh, written by egos that uh, depict a vengeful, wrathful deity, judgmental, likely to annihilate me on a whim just because it's Thursday, you know, something like that. So there was a deep um, respect for the body that came out of that and a real listening to it. This is where contemplation came out of, actually. Having to, to trust that wisdom. What does my body want to eat? Rather than telling myself, I am vegan or I am vegetarian or you know, I'm not going to eat wheat. I you know, went through all these phases. And in the end, just really actually discarding all that and saying, what does my body want to eat? When does my body want to sleep? Which question does my body like when I'm contemplating? And recognizing it was like um, a tuning fork that sings and resonates with joy when it finds a question or an insight or an epiphany or in deep meditation. And my body's just bathing in this and really loving this soft presence that's just here and is never going to force itself upon the body. So <clears throat> the body gets a really bad rap uh, you know if you look at history we should we should mortify the body we should punish it we should you know and, and the buddha was um of one of the first advocates i came across for that middle way don't indulge it too much don't um deny it too much don't, don't eat too much sleep too much or too little you know and I hope these words are starting to touch what you're talking about, but please say if they're not. Um, there, there was falling back in love with my body, wanting to experience it directly rather than what I thought about it. Hence all that, all those months of contemplating because I really thought I hated it and was ashamed of my body. I actually found out I was utterly in love with it. Quite shocked to find it was really quite beautiful when I stopped thinking about it, the shape of it and everything. The so-called imperfections, you know, cesarean scars and all that stuff and wrinkles and all that, you know, stuff that we have. And it became, on some level, the most important thing because I knew my body would never lie to me. Never. My mind <laughs> did and does and would if I really took it, not through any fault of my mind, but my body, you know, I can say I am the infinite source of everything. And your body goes, you don't believe that, you know, <laughs> or someone else has an epiphany and an awakening. You're going, I'm so pleased for them. And your body goes, no, you're not, you know, <laughs> you're pleased, but you're also insanely jealous. So yeah. there was this absolute base level honesty that the body brought me back to a real humbling every single time. And um, there's also that, that sort of gut um, area that seems to be really important to me when I'm not in my, or, or I've gone into a deep meditation. And um, it's a way, I mean, um, when we were on that retreat in Glastonbury, I was very grateful to the Qigong for doing that, for bringing it back in. Yeah. And, and assimilating something that, I, well, I wouldn't know how to do it. The body could actually take that. Yeah, but it knows. I, I it just knows. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, okay. <laughs> the, gut, the gut, for me, the solar plexus chakra, the gut, was the most challenging one for me. And for quite some time, there was this, uh, it, it was really only about my, my body receiving the effects of my awakening. Um, <clears throat> uh, literally, literally, in the most literal sense of the word, embodying this awakening. Very literally, as in immediate, not, not as in a concept, just mm. are my cells relaxed? And the gut, there was this, you know, I'd really got it intellectually, really even got it in the heart. And, um, but there was this big ball of fear and tension in the gut that just, I've got my hands where you can't see them in front of, you know, like in a real ball of fear and tension still. And that was that 
no thing that was saying that the body was hmm. because everything I'd ever done with my body I'd done without its consent okay I'm gonna go to the gym and I'm gonna do 5k run faster than I've ever done without even stopping to ask my body if it wanted that did that even feel good even when I did yoga or meditation or uh, anything at all um, it was uh, a forceful movement okay I'm going to stretch into this asana now and it was like some kind of violation I don't know if it's making any sense what I'm saying but there was a yeah yeah it does it does and and, and I uh, I appreciate I, I like hearing you say that because um, uh, as you say it's not often the body's in own intelligence is not often appreciated you know that 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 it 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 knows as you say the body does not lie and the only time that I've heard it is when it's in pain you know when we've got pain and it's telling us something um that's when the only time we stop you know whoops you know I've got a you know I've got problem here Uh, something's going on and and then we don't like it because you know And, and I've been doing this um uh, with Linda this uh, simple yoga where it's not about stretching into particular asanas it's just uh, relaxing and, and letting your body go into that shape as much as it wants to it's very intuitively based and it's been absolutely amazing my body has just been able to kind of yawn and let go of stuff that it's been holding on to for who knows how long yawn is the best word an energetic yawn something yeah. like that. you know what I mean right so that that was the icing on the cake for me it, it flipped completely from it never actually seen my body I thought I knew my body every time I looked in front of the in the mirror I was astonished to find I've never met it just been in my head about it right so it became all important because it will not um I remember Ajishanti when when I sat with him talking about this that the body will not lie to you your friends might you know and, and your mind will and all the rest of it but you, you know and so yeah you, you know you, you, you're I really like the way you got your hair today and they're going you know they don't um but your body's never gonna no. it, it can't well there's a lot of it that we can't see mm-hmm. or even um be in touch with you, you know when we get into the smaller parts and yeah but it's it's still got a life force it's still moving doing its thing so yeah and uh, for me getting in touch with that mm. and you know is it really true i'm not safe and there's a there's a response in the body when i ask that mm. and then if i ask a different question there's another response and i can my body's telling me immediately this is the question for you right now or well, this one isn't interesting yeah and you have an epiphany. The reason an insight and epiphany feels so good is because the body sings for that moment, doesn't it, in response? It just does its thing. And it's I, I think for me also, it takes longer to have that embodiment yeah. than it does for the thought to say, yeah, I know that. Yeah. You know, I, I understand those words. I can take those words in. But to actually let them land takes... Um, well, I was going to say time. It's not time. Uh, uh, another kind of allowance. Yeah, it's like a, a deeper. Am I going to slow get down through enough? that? I know. Yeah, and then um, come through. Okay. And there was um that that was the the healing of the gut for me was that willingness to just slow down. Mm. Like I'm going to go to the gym when I find myself getting in the car to go. I might loosely plan, okay, I'll go today. But if I don't go, I don't go. Not out of resistance. It's like that, that my body just will not do it today. And I, I won't violate it by doing it anyway. It's like worshipped in a different way. Worshipped as the self. Revered as the self. It knows way more. It knows way more than I, as a separate being, could ever know. And it is made of the universe and the, the source of the universe. So um, 
there's just a, a bowing inside to that, you know, some kind of reverence for it in a way that I could never have before. <clears throat> thank you for that thank you lovely okay that's a wonderful conversation a wonderful place to leave it for today um thank you all for your questions that you've sent in and for your um sharings there uh absolutely it's when we all share together that we go deeper isn't it so thank you very much thank you namaste Thank <clears throat> you.